Good morning. And welcome to you all. We're so grateful that you're here, and I know you have come for a very good reason today. We have been so blessed already with our guest, uh, who is providing the Parchment Endowed Lectures for us. Uh, Dr. John Swinton uh, is going to be speaking today on Finding Peace with God, a Deeper, Kinder, practical theology of mental health. We've already had numerous great conversations with Dr. Swinton, um, and we've even learned that he's quite the musician. Unfortunately, he has not brought his guitar with us, so we won't be enjoying that today. But he has uh, done a beautiful job of inviting us to think in practical theological terms in new ways about mental health and our theological reflection upon it. He is the Professor in Practical Theology and Pastoral Care and Chair in Divinity and Religious Studies at the University of Aberdeen. For more than a decade, he worked as a registered mental health nurse, which I think is remarkable. And um, in our conversation, I've learned that it has very much shaped uh, the research and teaching that he has done since then. He's also worked for a number of years as a hospital and community mental health chaplain alongside people with severe mental health challenges, and has uh, also then published widely within the area of mental health, dementia, disability, spirituality, and health care, and the list goes on. He's the author of numerous books, including this one, which I picked up yesterday, and I hope you all know there are multiple book options available in the narthex entitled Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Lives of People with Mental Health Challenges. We could not be more grateful today to welcome Dr. Swinton and to hear from him on this really critical topic for our time. Thank you, please come. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming back, and for, thank you for coming, full stop. The, um, yesterday we began to look at a slightly different way of thinking about mental health based on the biblical idea of shalom. Shalom meaning peace with one another, peace with ourselves, peace with one another, peace with God. And we looked at it in terms of its internal dynamics, the way our minds function, the way we uh, find our well-being our external di dynamics with our relationships with other people, and our relationships with creation. And we looked at the political, economic, and ecological dimensions of mental health that we need to take into consideration. So today, I, I want to kind of help us to think about what these things mean for the way that we live our lives as, as Christians. So when viewed through the lens of shalom, mental health and mental health care are found to be complex and diverse with far-reaching implications for individuals, for communities, and for creation. Care for individuals remains crucial, as do our current models of helping people to find healing. But caring for the places where individuals live out their lives and recognizing the importance of these places as loci for the formation of mental ill health is equally as important if we're to be true to our tasks to care for creation and to become a people of shalom. So in this final lecture, I want to consider some of the things that we might have to do in order to live into the vision of shalom as mental health. I'm not asking you to become anti-capitalists or eco-warriors, unless of course that's your calling. Nor am I asking you to push back the powers and principalities that cause conditions for mental ill health, at least not on your own. That's God's job. Our job is to love, to pray, and resist as best as we can. So we can't do everything, but we can do something. And I suggest that there are four areas, areas that we need to consider. Firstly, we need to learn to live kindly and think corporately. Secondly, we need to uh, decommodify our minds. Thirdly, we need to heal the symptom pool in order that people can live healthily even in the midst of suffering and distress. And finally, we need to learn to love our neighbors and our future neighbors. 
So these four things are not intended to form a comprehensive strategy, but they can form the beginning point for a deeper, kinder, practical theology of mental health. And every journey has to begin somewhere. So living kindly, thinking corporately. In lecture one, we explored the importance of recognizing that human beings are relational creatures, deeply embedded in and dependent on the presence of others. We share our lives together. We share our minds together. Central to the, uh, the harmonizing dynamic of shalom is a particular way of being with one another uh, and one another that reflects the mutuality, this mutuality in deep and important ways. I'd name that the way of kindness. Kindness is a gift of the Spirit and a way of being in the world that takes on the shape of Jesus. In Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, Paul urges us to be kind. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So kindness is an aspect of the character of God in Jesus, a gift of the Spirit and the vocation of those made in God's image. Kindness reminds us of who we are and whose we are. Now, I use the term kindness in two ways. The first relates to kindness as a practice. Now, when we reflect on the types of issues we've explored in these last two lectures, we can see that lying at the heart of all these issues is a fundamental lack of kindness. The reason many people experience mental health problems is because their lives have been subject to much unkindness during their early years or at some point in their life's journey. The problems they have hold within, sorry, the problems they, the problems they hold within their bodies is testimony to the unkindness of others. The loneliness and isolation that's experienced by many people with mental health challenges emerges from the way in which society constructs mental health challenges in deeply negative ways. These constructions are not, in inverted commas, part of their condition. They are problems that emerge from the place in where they experience their condition. The over-individualization of mental health challenges and the imposition of stigma based on presumed differences between them, in inverted commas, and us, in inverted commas, is simply unkind as well as unnecessary. Assuming the personal without recognizing the corporate dimensions of mental health challenges uh, allows a broader society to abrogate responsibility, which in turn leads to distancing, shame, and unkindness. The worldview and the practical anthropology that emerges from the type of politics and economics we looked at in lecture two are deeply unkind, particularly towards the poorest and most vulnerable within our society. At the same time, they're very kind to those who benefit from the system and whose lives are often marked by extreme excess. So this unkind system reveals itself in individuals being unkind to themselves assuming that their problems are completely down to them, something that, as we have seen, can be reinforced by certain ways of thinking about mental health. Again, we end up with forms of shame and self-alienation that layer themselves on top of already troubled individuals. Organizations, political systems, and economies that refuse to look downwards will always fail to be kind to those who are trapped below its gaze. The anthropology that emerges from such systems is likewise unkind. The idea that we look towards ourselves and away from others, the presumption that, presumption that others are foes and competitors rather than friends and fellow travelers, the assumption that those who cannot achieve are wasting resources is an unkind way to frame human beings. The idea that our health and well-being can be framed in terms of lucrative markets rather than mutual moral responsibility ends up with systems and practices that are filled with unkindness. And as we have seen, we're showing little kindness towards creation with all the implication that has for 
our mental health. So all of these dimensions of unkindness cause deep disruption to God's shalom and fail to reveal the love, the mercy, and the kindness of Jesus. Kindness is a set of practices that, which, which can counter the unkindness that surrounds us. But kindness is not only compassionate action. Kindness is a statement about the nature of God and by implication, the nature of human beings. Julian of Norwich informs us that God is kind in his being. Goodness is the kind of thing that God is. This is an important observation. The term kindness, as Julian uses it here, comes from Middle English, wherein the word has a complex set of meanings that we rarely consider nowadays. It indicates the benevolence that we mean today when we speak of someone as being kind. It also indicates the nature of a thing, what kind of thing it is, as when we speak of humankind. And somewhere between benevolence and nature, it indicates the relationship between those who share a common nature, uh, kin or kindred. In any particular instance, the word kind may well carry all of these meanings. To say that someone treated you kindly would be to say she acted in a benevolent way kindly, as if you were her relative, kindred, and in a way that is only natural to someone like her, her kind. Julian's use of the term encompasses all of these meanings. So kindness is not simply something God does, it's something God is. God is kind. More than that, in the incarnation of Jesus, God becomes our kind. It's as we come to know the kindness of God, to understand Jesus as kin, that we discover the kind of creatures we are. In Jesus, in Jesus we discover that we are kin, called to act kindly in a world ruled by God, who is kind. So kindness does seem to be more than just a set of compassionate actions, although, of course, it is that. It's the recognition of the kind of thing that we are, the kinship that we share with others, and the kinship we share with creation, as Jesus, in his kindness, seeks to bring all about the redemption of all things. As creatures made in the image of a kind God, kindness in all of its dimensions is part of the kind of thing you are the kind of thing we are. So acting kindly is the first step away from stigma and towards belonging. No matter how different people's experiences may be as they journey through their mental health challenges, people are always our kind and should always be treated kindly. There's no room for distancing and othering in a community of kindness. Kindness leads to the creation of communities where people truly belong, where their bodies are seen as bridges rather than barriers. People will certainly need professional help, and that should be welcomed. However, the role of the body of Christ is not primarily to deliver therapy. The task of the, task of the body of Christ is to be kind and to remind people of the kind of creatures that they are. So we can begin to see that Kindness sits at the heart of shalom as mental health. When we recognize what kind of creatures we are, people who long to relate and belong and to be with others who act kindly, we can begin to act kindly towards one another. Kindness pushes us to think corporately. Acting kindly requires that we learn to think corporately. So the term corporate is used extensively in business and relates to big companies or a large company. It's very much tied in with the kind of neoliberal economic worldview we looked at in lecture two. It's very much that there is, however, another way in which we can think about the idea of the corporate. Corporate means acting together as a group rather than as separate people. To act corporately, is to act as one body, recognizing the kind of people we are, irreducibly relational, 
enables us to act and think corporately. To think corporately is to think with the mind of Christ. So the ideas of the body of Christ and the mind of Christ we explored in lecture one draw our attention to the corporate nature of the Christian life. We are who we are in Christ and we live into our kindness as we encounter the kindness of others. We suffer together, we find healing together. So in contrast to the individualization of mental health challenges, thinking corporately about mental health issues allows them to become shared experiences. Rather than only thinking in terms of individuals with mental health challenges, important as individuals are, the community of kindness shares in the sufferings of the body. If one member of the body experiences a mental health challenge, we all do. In a sense, the body of Jesus has mental health challenges. So thinking in this way helps us to avoid abandoning one another. When someone becomes unwell, our duty is to show kindness, to visit, to try to understand, to help people find the right kind of help, to offer friendship, to offer kinship. Recognizing the shared ownership of mental health challenges also helps us to avoid abandoning carers. Caring can be a very lonely and exhausting calling. If the body of Christ has mental health challenges, if we think corporately, then the task of caring belongs to us all. The kindness of respite, accompaniment, prayer, all offer release for people when the exhausting process of caring for someone who is languishing begins to take its toll. So kindness and corporate thinking lead to solidarity, standing firm with one another. Sharing solidarity, standing firm with one another, means that the church must become a place of sanctuary and a place of prophetic action. Sanctuary refers to a refuge or safety from pursuit, persecution, or other forms of danger. In a pathogenic and often hostile culture, sanctuary can be hard to find. As shalom people driven by the kindness of God, we must become sanctuary. We need to become a people who recognize cultural pathologies and wrestle through prayer, practice, and presence to provide safe places of sanctuary where those of us struggling with our mental health can encounter the kindness of shalom. So in showing such solidarity and offering a sanctuary does not mean annexation. People remain individuals, uh, free to make their own choices and to live separate lives. It does, however, mean recognition of the interconnectedness of our minds and bodies and an intentional effort to live that out within the sanctuary of kindness. So sanctuary must not be an escape from the world. Having recognized the kinds of issues I have highlighted in these lectures, we are called to offer prophetic resistance and critique. Now, I'm not suggesting that we become political activists, although if that's your calling, that's what you should do. But I am suggesting that we allow the spirit to transform our minds in ways that enable us to function kindly in the midst of a deeply challenging cultural uh, context. A first step towards such a goal uh, is what I want to call the, de the decommodifying of our minds. In lecture two, the power of the markets. In lecture two, we noted the power of the markets to commodify the world and teach us how to understand things like worth, value, normality, and acceptable life direction. Whilst markets may rule our economic systems, they don't have to rule our minds. If we are effectively to engage in our mission of shalomic kindness, we need to decommodify our minds. The idea of decommodification relates to forms of critical thinking that recognize and intentionally resist the commodifying tendencies of our systems. A decommodified mind strives to think with the mind of Christ, that is, to develop a mindset that is determined by kindness rather than by the values of the market. Decommodification does not mean withdrawing from the system of neoliberalism. 
It's not obvious to me how this could be done without withdrawal, withdrawal simply meaning surrender. It does have our I mean finding a way of resisting the anthropology and worldview that it creates and intentionally pushing against those aspects that are damaging for people's mental health. Decommodification is a habit we should strive to gain in every aspect of our life. But it's something we should take particularly seriously as we wind our way through our highly commodified healthcare systems. Modern healthcare and modern mental health care is big business. It comprises of a variety of different markets within which people and things are commodified in ways that are intended to maximize financial gain and bring about acceptable health outcomes. The skills of clinicians are packaged, bought and sold, as are the technologies they supply. Time, effort, presence, outcomes are all commodified, shaped and formed by the needs of internal and external mar markets. Now, this comes with obvious tensions and temptations. If personal financial payments become marketing tools, the potential for implicit or explicit bias is obvious. If we take as an example the pharmaceutical market, some of the issues around the importance of decommodifying our thinking will become clear. So the marketing of psychiatric medication has become a very uh, lucrative market. Uh, with that comes, again, obvious temptations. As new con uh, conditions enter the symptom pool through the DSM or via the creation of lay, lay diagnoses such as eco-anxiety, solastalgia, or by people self-diagnosing via the internet, they're accompanied by new medications or the rerouting of old medications. As a push towards biological explanations of mental health challenges continues, so the temptation to develop codependent relationships between drug companies and biological psychiatry becomes alluring. With the permitting of straight-to-customer sellings of psychopharmaceutical products comes the temptation to move people away from evidence-based justifications for the giving or not giving a medication towards an emphasis on good marketing strategies based on the assumption that the good life is defined by such things as self-determination of happiness and freedom from anxiety. If we're to decommodify our thinking within this area, we need to think corporately and kindly about what medication is and what it's intended to do. Now, to be clear, decommodifying medication does not mean ceasing to recommend or use medication, and it certainly does not mean stopping taking medication. Medication is a very important part of many people's lives. Nevertheless, the reasons for giving and receiving medication and the impact it has on people is also very important. A reflection in Paul's perspective on the body and the mind in lecture one showed the centrality of the body as the ground of our personhood and the ways in which the body is foundationally relational and participatory. If that's so, the proper goal of psychopharmacology is not simply to deal with individual symptoms or behaviors that appear problematic for individuals or others, although it may, of course, do that. The theological goal of psychopharmacology is to remove any barriers that prevent someone from engaging in the kinds of relationships and human connections that hold us healthily in our shared mind and our corporate personality. So medication faithfully prescribed and administered allows the development of what Susan Eastman describes as life-giving connections rather than self-directed, self-sufficient individualism. If the motivation for giving and receiving medication has a particular moral goal, then alongside the standard clinical questions we need to ask when prescribing, we must ask another set of questions. So, decommodifying prescribing. If we are to decommodify the practice of describing, the questions asked by prescribers cannot simply be, is this the cheapest drug that will control this particular feeling or behavior? This is a question that focuses on medication as a commodity to be maximized for profit. 
Likewise, the principal question cannot be, does this medication work? If the definition of what work means is not clear. Does work mean controlling symptoms? Does work mean making life easier for the individual? Does work mean making life easier for families? Does work mean making life easier for society? Or does work mean helping individuals to renegotiate their relational connectedness with God and others and themselves in ways that bring about life in all of its fullness? Shalom. Work is complicated. Such questions draw our attention not only to what medication does in a biomedical sense, but also to what it means within the life of the individual and those around her. Whilst all of these aspects of work may be important, the issue of meaning and the implication of the impact of the drug for someone's personhood is the overarching theological priority, which gives and that overarching theological priority gives the other forms of work their intention and their goal. So if we are to decommodify our thinking in relation to psychopharmacology and offer a kinder, gentler way of framing medication and the practice of medicating, there are four questions that a prescriber might want to bear in mind. One, in what sense does this medication facilitate a person's movement back into relationship with God and self and others? Two, for whose benefit is this medication being administered? The individual, the family, society, the physician, or the drug company? Three, what will the person gain by the administration of this medication? And four, equally as importantly, what will a person lose if this medication is administered? So similar decommodifying questions may be asked of our counseling endeavors or our reverse efforts to help people develop resilience? Are we utilizing a theological anthropology of kindness that will allow us to discern the causes of people's troubles and the goals of our practices? Or are we consciously or unconsciously focusing attention on helping people cope with unjust systems without touching these unfair systems? Is it important that we think corporately, sorry, it is important that we think uh, corporately here. Helping people to cope with unjust systems is of course important and oftentimes necessary. People broken by unjust systems need healing, they need resilience, they need to be able to cope. The healing ministry of Jesus bears witness to the fact that sometimes we need to help fix a man broken people enmeshed in unjust social and spiritual systems even if our long-term goal is to change the systems that break them. That is why the various practices that comprise mental health ministry should be viewed corporately as a part of the wider ministry of the church to the world, which should be focused on justice, fairness, and resisting unjust structures. It's getting the balance between caring for the individual, helping them to find resilience, and making changes to the system that bring about shalom. So decommodifying our minds allows us to engage in small acts of resistance. Alone, we may not be able to change the system, but we can change our minds. When we talked about shalom, we talked about the idea that people would, uh, within that idea of mental health as shalom, were able to find health in the midst of ill health. So I want us now to think about the idea of healing the symptom pool, helping people to live healthily, even in the midst of suffering and distress. In lecture one, I suggested that one aspect of shalom as mental health is a desire to enable people to understand that health is not marked by the absence of symptoms, but by the presence of Jesus and the presence of meaning and purpose and all of these things that come with that. It's possible to find mental health even when others assume you're mentally unhealthy. In order to reflect on what that suggestion might actually look like, we need once again to return to the idea of the symptom pool. One of the most painful dimensions of the experience of mental health is stigma. 
Stigma occurs when non-professionals take the symptoms associated with a mental health challenge and give them negative social meanings. Stigma is profoundly unkind and fractures shalom and personhood in deep ways. In order to move beyond such distortions, we need to consider bringing healing to the symptom pool. This will mean interpreting symptoms differently. I focus on the experience of schizophrenia, one of the most difficult and misunderstood forms of mental health, will help to draw out the importance of this. So kindness and schizophrenia. The story of schizophrenia is one of deep unkindness and alienation. In the West, it's a highly stigmatized and feared condition. The experience of people living with schizophrenia transgress cultural assumptions about normality in ways that are subtle and powerful. People see and hear things others cannot see. They believe things others assume, others assume to be false or bizarre. People with schizophrenia are urged to, urged to take medicine for the rest of their lives and are thus understood as ill, dependent, and vulnerable. People are perceived as out of their minds, in inverted commas. That is, their experience of mind is different from the standard account of mind assumed, by, assumed to be normal in Western culture. Even when we attempt to overcome the negative connotations of the story, for example, for example by arguing that it has a, a biological basis, we end up with a rather unkind implication. Ethan Waters observes that our biomedical advances are hard to separate from our particular cultural beliefs. It's difficult to distinguish, for example, the biomedical conception of schizophrenia, the idea that the disease exists within the biochemistry of the brain from the more inchoate Western assumption that the self resides there as well. Mental illness is feared and has such a stigma because it represents a reversal of what Western human beings have come to value as the essence of what, a human be of what human nature is. Because our culture so highly values an, uh, an, an illusion of self-control and, and uh, the ability to control your circumstances, we become abject when contemplating mentation that seems more changeable, less restrained, less controllable, more open to outside influences than we would imagine it to be. So the symptoms of schizophrenia pushed deeply into cultural fears. The problem for people with schizophrenia in the West is that the symptoms of the condition transgress cultural norms about mind, self, and humanness. Because of this cultural dissonance, dissonance stigma and alienation become a primary response. People are very much perceived as not being of our kind and are often treated unkindly. But this is not the same across cultures. Tanya Lorman has observed that in cultures such as India and Africa, people are treated much kindlier. People are not told that they have an incurable illness. They're not inevitably taken out of their home environment and treated as if they had an interminable illness. Medication is still used, but it's not assumed to be the only mode of healing necessary to ensure a person's well-being. People tend to remain in their communities and continue to have broader life options such as employment and friendship and a valued place within community. Precisely those things that Westerners tend to lose, as at least partly due to the stigmatized interpretation of this condition. In line with what we discussed in lecture one, people in these cultures have a different theory of mind. The mind is assumed to be open to the community, to ancestors, to other voices, the experience of hearing an external voice is not as alien to people there as it is to people in the West, and therefore it's not as terrifying. In India, it has been noted that people, including professionals, don't use the term schizophrenia at all, thus overcoming the power of the label by silencing it. The language around, uh, used around schizophrenia in the West, such as crazy, madman, all these sorts of horrible uh, metaphors and ideas, creates people whom it appears are not our kind. This in turn leads to unkind actions such as stigma, alienation, and violence. 
When people are treated kindly, things can be different. As Amy Sousa discovered in her work amongst families living with schizophrenia in India, individuals didn't think of themselves as having a career-ending illness. They expected to recover. And at least in comparison with Western people with schizophrenia, they did. So the contrast between the different cultures is significant. One response is based on fear and distancing. The other is based on kindness. My point is not that schizophrenia can be cured by kindness, although it can be healed by kindness. The experience and its accompanying symptoms can be looked upon more kindly. If, for example, we think differently about the symptoms of schizophrenia, interesting things begin to emerge. It's true that, it's true that experiences such as hearing things uh, others do not are unusual. But as we have seen, Christians have similar experiences, the difference being that they have the social power to legitimate their experiences as authentic and acceptable. But the basic fracturing of the Western theory of mind is the same. People are not out of their minds. They're struggling with an experience that is common to Christians, but here is manifesting itself in a way that is problematic for individuals. Even extraordinary experiences can thus be seen to be more normal than we might think. Likewise, people who struggle with such experiences remain our kind, even in the midst of confusion and distress. So healing the symptom pool means naming things differently, moving beyond cultural stereotypes and stigma and thinking about what does it mean if we look at this thing differently? If we change the way we name this symptom, in this case, hearing voices, we change the way it is understood. So if we use the term hallucinations, this indicates that the experience is a meaningless symptom. However, if we change the name of the symptom to voice hearing, we find ourselves drawn into a more relational frame. People hear voices, and often these voices are meaningful, relationship, relational, and significant. Yes, the voices can be disturbing and abusive, but sometimes they're peaceable and supportive. A simple shift in te terminology from hallucinations to hearing voices personalizes the symptoms, draws out its relational aspects, and offers a different option for the symptom pool. This in turn offers different ways of responding. Medication may be necessary, but helping people to manage their voices in ways that enable them to live healthily in the midst of difficulties is also an option. The organization called the Hearing Voices Network does precisely this by creating communities of voice hearers who meet together to share their experiences and to learn from one another how to manage their voices. People living with schizophrenia or any other form of mental health challenges need understanding, kindness, friendship, and a certain way of re revisioning the symptom pool that reminds people of their kindness, their kinship. Kindness reinforces kinship. Yes, people hear voices. Yes, these voices are disturbing, but no, this need not prevent them from living well in the midst of disturbance. And that's the very essence of what shalom is, as mental health intends to do. You may never be cured of your condition, but you can be healed. Within shalom, we can expect people to recover if recovery is defined by finding a place of sanctuary, belonging and hope, where they can live well even in the midst of their wildest storms. Finally, as we move towards the end of this lecture, yesterday we looked at the ecological, uh, the impact of ecological damage on mental health. Um, the focus on ecolo the ecological dimensions of mental health reminds us not only of the importance of caring for creation, but also of the significance of recognizing the eschatological dimensions of mental health and mental health care. A temptation when we think about mental health is to focus on the immediate problem, that is, the ways in which we can help people before us who are struggling with their mental health. 
This makes sense, and we absolutely should do that to the best of our ability. We're called to offer love and kindness to those we encounter at this moment. Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself is unbending. People matter now. Nevertheless, shalom is an eschatological concept, and so is mental health care. Mental health care now is important, but the mental health of, uh, in the lives of those who come after us is equally as important. We're called to love our neighbor now, and we're also called to love our future neighbor. That means making sure that the world which God so loved that he gave Jesus is a place fit for the purposes of future love. We're called to forms of eschatological love which value creation now and desire to ensure the gift of creation remains healthy, available, and beautiful for our future neighbors. And this requires that we de decommodify our view of the planet, moving away from the commodification of the world towards a view of creation as a gift that God gives to us and asks us to care for, to treat with tenderness and love. Rodney Clapp urges us to think beyond the instrumentality of a neoliberal worldview. And he says this, in stark contrast to the anthropocentric preoccupations of both modernity and post-modernity, biblical faith affirms that creation is an eloquent gift of extravagant love. This is not a world of objects that sits mutely waiting for the human being subject to master them. Rather, this is a world of created fellow subjects, all called into being by the same creator, all born of the creator's love, all included in the creator's covenant of creational restoration, and all responsive agents in the kingdom of the beloved son. A creation called into being by the word of God, created in and through and for Christ, in whom all creation coheres, is not a mechanistic system, but a dynamic, personal, living creation that has a voice. When creation is perceived as a gift to be received and a mutual duty to be lived out, we become aware of the significance of intentionally being in the world and living into the gift of creation. So, in 2021, I joined a group of musicians called the Porter's Gate, who are a collective that come together to write uh, new contemporary worship songs. We gathered together uh, for a songwriting project on a beautiful island off Vancouver called Keats Island. The meeting was organized by Sanctuary Mental Health Ministries, which is a Vancouver-based organization focused on enabling churches to care well with people uh, with me who have mental health challenges. The intention was to write an album of worship songs focused on the experience of people with mental health challenges. The album was titled, and is titled, Sanctuary Songs, and it came out earlier this year. And it's hopefully it's helping people to worship well in difficult times. One of the songs we wrote was titled The Centering Prayer. And the chorus runs like this. I want to be where my feet are. I want to breathe the life around me. I want to listen as my heart beats right on time. I want to be where my feet are. It's a very lovely and deeply evocative song. It talks about the importance of recognizing where you are in the moment. Realizing that where our feet are rooted and planted and what that means for the ways in which we encounter God's good gift of creation. I'm very much an urbanite. I tend not to think deeply about my relationship with the land or importance of the, of the, of the ground I stand on. I imagine if I lived in the countryside, I see things differently. But whether we are urbanites or country people, we learn to be, we need to learn to be where our feet are. We need to learn what it means truly to be present in the world. There's a beautiful spiritual practice called the, the spirituality of the present moment or the sacrament of the present moment. Well, the sacrament in the present moment is when you take time, you find stillness, you reflect on your breathing, 
and you recognize that every breath that you have is a gift from God. And when you recognize that every breath that you have is a gift from God, you realize where you are. When you begin to feel your feet on the ground, you realize that you are in that gifted space, that sacramental space that God has given to us. We saw in lecture two the dangers of commodifying the world and the power of our, of our, that our destruction of creation has to damage our mental health. If we are to live as shalom people, we need to commodify our thinking about the world or decommodify our thinking about the world. And the first step, literally, towards such a goal is to feel, touch, and learn to love the ground on which we are standing. The ground on which we stand is holy ground, created matter that matters. When we learn to respect the land, accept it as a gift, and realize the importance of being present within it or upon it, the possibility of reconnecting with it and acting differently towards it becomes possible. Decommodifying the land and noticing where our feet are reminds us of our kinship with the land and helps us to treat creation kindly. There's much more to be said on this, but for now, noticing that self-awareness is the first step towards uh, uh, ecological, moving away from ecological homelessness to spiritual homefulness will at least get us on the road to this dimension of shalom. Caring for creation, being kind to creation, is a complex political, economic, and social problem. But our reconnection with the land as individuals and as communities is something that we can do right now. And so we've come to the end of our time together. In these lectures, I've tried to show the importance of looking inwards, looking outwards, and looking upwards for the ways in which we understand and respond to mental health issues and develop mental health strategies. Reflecting on the kindness of Jesus, who, has, and, uh, who brings us shalom, provides us with a theological framework to begin this important work of reconnection and healing. I'll conclude with the words from one of the songs from the Porter's Gate album I mentioned previously, in which I, I had the pleasure of, of co-writing. And it's very simple. It goes just like this. It says, you are my sanctuary, my hiding place where I belong. You are my peaceful harbor, and you will bring me safely home. And the simplicity of these words uh, give us the guide that we need, perhaps, to live into the vision of shalom, shalom. I think it's true. God will bring us safely home. Life is full of storms, but we need a place of sanctuary. We need peace. We need shalom. We need Jesus, and he will bring us safely home. Thank you.